Hello. Our story begins inside the archives of the Jedi Temple, where Padme Naberi was sitting quietly, studying. She was one of the few selected Jedi from the planet Naboo in the last couple centuries. Padme was 14 years old at the moment, and she was a student of one of the greatest Jedi in the entire Order. Her instructor was Mace Windu, the current master of the Order. Mace was one of the premier instructors the Jedi had. He was the youngest Jedi to ever become a member on the High Council, and his first student joined the Council within a decade of him becoming a member. Mace was clearly a shining example of what a Jedi should be, and Padme was constantly inspired to be better because of him. She was currently inside the Archive studying. Mace ran a tight ship with the students. His bond with them was inseparable. Currently, he was in the chambers with the Council. It wasn't easy for him to balance everything out, but he made it work, especially with a talent like Padme. The Council had just returned from Naboo, and they were discussing Yaddle, having stepped down from their ranks. Mace was helming the session while a student was sitting in the Archives. She had music playing in one of her ears, and she was reading through a number of texts Mace wanted her to read through. As she was doing so, she could see a shadow moving across the room. She looked up and smiled, blowing the music from her ear and jumping up. Padme got to his side and called him by his name. The tall Jedi Master turned over and smiled at her, asking her what was going on, and she just asked how he was doing. Dooku looked down, and he placed his hand on her shoulder and told her that he'd be alright. Why Ganjin was one with the Force, nothing would change that. He expressed that she'd be open-minded during her journey as a Jedi. He believed she'd be capable of great things in her future. She smiled as he pulled his hand away, and she grabbed it. She looked up at the towering man and told him that if he ever needed to talk about what happened, she'd be willing to listen. He smiled, but there was an ominous pain behind that smile. Dooku just told her that he appreciated her kindness. Her heart would guide her in a future she had yet to see. She released her grip, as Dooku wished that the Force be with her, now ending in the berry before walking away. She went back to her studies to complete what she was assigned, working diligently as ever. In the coming weeks, she would learn that Dooku and Yaddle were gone, having left the Jedi Order. It was difficult for her. She knew Dooku and her master were close, and she felt like it was wrong that things played out the way they did. She didn't blame her master at all, but he did bear the pain from the disappearance of his friends. It was hard for him, but as master of the Order, he had to be resilient. If he gave up, then he could become detrimental to his brothers and sisters. Mace would become semi-distant in the coming days to weeks, not cutting off from his student, but letting her wander a little more freely than he would have allowed her otherwise. Padme was fine. She had her friends, and she was well-liked by just about anyone. She was Mace's student, after all, but she was also a shining example of a Jedi Padawan. There was a reason she was selected by Windu. Her focus and determination set her apart from her peers. She was a unique student, and similarly to Deppa, she fit Mace's teaching style. Both Deppa and Padme were at the top of their classes in their studies. When it came to lightsaber combat, usage of the Force, and physicality, both of the students were much more average in comparison to the rest of their class. Mace liked individuals who were intelligent and were hard workers. The rest would be easy from there. What worked with Deppa worked with Padme, and Mace was pleased that the two of them were similar to each other. Their personalities were vastly different from the other, but they worked equally as hard. Though Padme truthfully may have worked harder, simply due to the fact that she had massive shoes to fill. Deppa was an impressive student. Padme, on the other hand of her successes and hard work, learned of a boy who joined the Order. She wasn't going to chase him down, but he apparently had a high midi count, as the Jedi referred to it. Her friends mentioned it in passing, and everyone asked her, because she was Mace's student. But just like it was with everything else, Mace kept the knowledge between himself and his peers on the Council, separated from the knowledge he bestowed upon his student. He never crossed that boundary when it came to instructing his students. If his apprentice became a council member, then she could learn what he was talking about. Otherwise, it would stay within the walls of the council chambers. Padme was with her friends. They were all at lunch eating when one of her friends pointed out the new kid that they never saw before. He was sitting alone, and Padme suggested they go and sit with him. And so they all got up, moving their food and their Jedi tablets to his table, and spoke with him. As it turns out, this was the rumored kid. They all kind of figured, but now they had a name and a face. His name was Anakin Skywalker, he was from Tatooine. How peculiar. Padme was most quiet of the group. She ate slowly and read while she did, though she did respond to every couple sentences to make sure her friends knew she was involved in the conversation. Anakin previously had a fancy for the Queen of Naboo, the one he helped off a of Tatooine by winning a pod race, but Padme was almost angelic in his own perspective. She didn't pay him any extra mind though, she was just happy to be a friend for him, considering he was clearly alone. When they left the mess hall, Padme and her friends made their way to the archives once again to do another study hall with each other. Anakin was bewildered, but thanks to Padme, he was at least making friends. Her friends started inviting Anakin to sit with them and such. Padme, on the other hand, was typically locked in. This wasn't Mace pushing her too hard. This was her own desire to be like her master and his former pupil. 
both Deppa and Mace were remarkable Jedi Masters, and she had massive shoes to fill. Padme believed she could fill them. The cool thing about Padme's kindness is it got Anakin friends in his own age group. Padme and her friends were the older kids. Most of them, aside from the youngest in the group, were Jedi Padawans, so all the younglings saw them like upperclassmen. And because Anakin was welcomed by the big kids, all the younger kids figured that they would accept Anakin as well. It was a butterfly effect, and Anakin got the greatest reward from it which was a genuine welcoming committee from all of his peers. Regardless, Padme and her master would go out on missions together, and their missions would typically be more difficult, simply due to the fact that her instructor was Mace Windu. But Padme loved adversity. Her personal belief, which stemmed from her master, is that challenge bred strength. She was beginning to learn the same lightsaber form her master used, but it was even more difficult of a challenge than what the missions held for them. Form 7 was difficult to master alone, let alone the added effect of the pod. Padme, when she wasn't reading through essays and books in the span of hours, was inside the Jedi training facility, working as diligently as she could. She trusted the Force, but using Form 7 was very difficult on the body, and at 14, it was especially brutal on her. As a Jedi, she had the training to be fit enough to use a lightsaber without becoming sore or tired, but as is the nature of such a difficult form, it wore an individual down, no matter how conditioned they were. It was a last form for a reason. Only the most experienced and dedicated could master such a form. Mace wasn't hard on Padme, not as hard as he was with Deppa, but he also wasn't as hard on Padme as she was on herself. There wasn't a reason for Mace to be tamer with Padme. He was a lot more involved with Deppa, but he let Padme do her own thing. She was highly dedicated and she didn't want to disappoint, so she wasn't hard to motivate. Mace was continuously pleased with her, and due to his constricting schedule as Master of the Order, it was difficult to have a set time to teach her. When Mace taught Deppa, he was a knight becoming a master. Now he was a council member. It was very different and very difficult for him, but he made sure his student realized how much he valued her. However, Mace and Padme were much closer, in a way, than Mace and Deppa were. This was likely due to the fact that they had to trust each other a lot more than Mace and Deppa did. With his first student, Windu could be much more hands-on with her, so he didn't need to trust her ability to work alone. With his first student, Windu could be much more hands-on so he didn't need to trust her ability to work alone. With Padme, he was essentially forced to let her work on her own, while giving her a number of tasks to complete in a given day. They did see each other once a day, though the length of said session would vary greatly from day to day. There was also something else about this duo that made them close. The midichlorian counts were much closer. Mace had above 18,000, whereas Deppa had 11,900. Padme, on the other hand, had a count of 17,500, but of course, Having a high midichlorian count did not make a Jedi. Mace was much more emphatic about this point with Padme than he was with Deppa. The midi count wasn't something to flaunt about, it was just a measurement. What one did with said count is what made them the Jedi they became. If someone like Master Yoda with such a high midichlorian count didn't train and work as dedicatedly as he did, then there'd be no point to having such a high ceiling. Whereas if someone like Kenobi or Plo worked as hard as they did, then their potential was greatly untapped. The Force was entirely about how much someone wanted it. This was actually one of the few things Mace disagreed about with the Order. It was a midichlorian count minimum. Obviously not everyone should be allowed into the Order, but everyone had the Force. The Force is what gives a Jedi their power. It's an energy field created by all living things, because it surrounds and penetrates every living being, because it binds the galaxy together. So for the Jedi to just exclude someone based on the midichlorian count just felt wrong in his own mind. It obviously didn't eat him up, but it was a little disagreement he had with the Order's code and such. For the following years, Padme and Mace would continue their training. Her missions became exceedingly more difficult. Many of them required her to be in the top of her game, but she rose to each occasion. Whether the mission be political, spiritual, or whatnot, she made sure she was ready for each challenge. Padme loved the political arena in many of her missions with Mace Windu. The two of them would even debate politics for hours during their trips through hyperspace. Mace adored how interested his student was in what she was encountering. Sometimes, she would even show him up, not in a disrespectful way or even in a demeaning way. With more time on her hands than he had, she was able to do deep dives on locations, governments, politicians, and systems before they even left the temple. So she had nearly 300 years worth of information before they left Coruscant for a mission. Typically, these missions went as such. In the late evening or the early morning of the following day, Mace would tell her that they had a mission wherever it was. In both circumstances, unless it was a total emergency, Mace would have to spend several hours inside of a council session before leaving. This is where Padme would be in the archives, picking Jocasta's brain for the information she wanted. 
During these same few years, Padme became more friendly with Anakin. She never thought anything of it, but she did enjoy seeing how the bond with him helped him grow out of his shell. When they first met, he was cold. He didn't really let anyone in, or at least that's what she understood. Now, he was glowing. He had friends, and he was at the center of quite a few friendship groups. Because they were more friendly, she had more interactions with him. This was obviously him trying to get closer with her. He was putting himself into the archives and being studious like her, which naturally led to them having more conversations with each other. Being born and raised as a Jedi, she didn't pick up on the subtle hints that he was crushing on her, but she in a friendly way became close with him. When she wasn't actively studying, they had time to talk with each other, and she learned about the life he lived outside the Order on Tatooine. He told her everything, from his time as a slave to what life was like for him as a Jedi. Anakin also told her about something that happened relatively recently. At this point, Anakin was 12 and she was 17. Palpatine requested Anakin to a mission and he went, but truthfully, he was very uncomfortable being around Palpatine. The entire mission just felt wrong. Palpatine tried to give him the incentive to leave the Order, and Anakin just kind of awkwardly nodded his head along and agreed, but he told Padme that he was happy here inside the Order. He just wanted to get out of the situation. So, she told her friend that she would speak to her master about both circumstances. When Padme left to inform her master, she was surprised to learn that she was becoming a knight at the age of 17. It was a massive surprise to her, but she was very relieved and proud of herself. It was such an important moment, and yet again, another testament to the skill Mace Windu had as an instructor, being that Depa became a knight around the same age. He then told Padme that she would make a fine Jedi wherever the Force might guide her, and then she requested after the knighting ceremony time to speak with him alone. When they finally got their chance to be alone, she informed him about everything, the slavery on Tatooine and Palpatine's involvement with Skywalker. Mace didn't like either situation, but only one he could really do anything about. He informed her that as an individual, she could go with another knight to investigate the Outer Rim if she wanted. Perhaps there was something that could be done. As for Palpatine, Mace would have to talk with the Council about that. In a way, similar to Dooku, Mace was finding his own issues with the Republic. The only difference is, Windu knew how to control his emotions. Dooku's reaction to the behavior of the Republic was correct, how he went about it was not. As a Jedi Knight, Padme and one of her older friends, who was a new knight, went out to Tatooine to do a thorough investigation. Windu, on the other hand, would inform the Council of the creepy actions by the Chancellor. Truthfully, it was a little bizarre. They thought it might be grounds for removal from office. He might just have focus in the wrong areas of life. However, the Jedi without concrete evidence couldn't go forward with it. They needed evidence. The Council therefore requested that new member Shock T go to Anakin Skywalker and speak to him about the encounter, and if he had any interest in having it brought up. Padme, on the other hand, would be in Tatooine for a number of days even freeing a couple slaves while she was there. While she wasn't privy to it at the moment, her and her friend's actions would be grounds for the beginning of a slave rebellion. When she returned to the temple, the Jedi were even more at odds with the Republic than before. While Anakin didn't want to press any charges against Palpatine due to lack of evidence, they found the entire situation unnerving and made it clear that Anakin was not to interact with Palpatine ever again. If he did, he needed to be in the presence of his master or another Jedi master. The evidence brought back by Padme would be remarkable. It would give insight into everything the Jedi had been neglecting. Padme did everything. She had slave testimonials, she had holograms, she had purchased receipts from slaves she freed, and so forth. The Outer Rim was struggling, and so the case was brought from the Order to the Senate. At the same time, Padme had one of those receipts hidden, and she gave it to Anakin as a gift. While it wasn't the greatest gift in the galaxy, she figured he would sleep better knowing that his mother was free. The Council sent Coleman Trebor and a couple other masters, including Quinlan Voss, to the Outer Rim. When they eventually arrived, it was chaos. The entire planet of Tatooine erupted into a state of war. They didn't realize it, but the Jedi had done this, because Padme did more than just liberate a couple of random slaves. She freed Shmi, obviously, but the other few slaves she freed were warmongers from a number of other Outer Rim worlds. One of them was a captain that served under a Kalesh warlord named Grievous. Due to his enslavement, the captain decided to rally together the people, and they were willing to fight. The Jedi shouldn't have gotten involved any further, but Quinlan convinced Trevor that they needed to fight so they could show what was happening. As Quinlan said, the civilization was in desperation for control. This was Quinlan playing political. He knew he wouldn't get his help without saying something so out of character for himself. The Jedi would return days later, having lost one of their masters to the conflict, but having all the information they needed to prove there was legitimate neglect in the Outer Rim. Padme, on the other hand, was understanding more about Anakin. 
Without having initial access to her emotions due to being a Jedi, she learned what it was like to have such emotions. However, this didn't mean that she was falling for Anakin. It just meant that she had empathy and that she was able to be sympathetic with someone she might not understand fully or even feel like fully. It's what made her a great Jedi and a great person. While the relationship was innocent, it would cause Anakin to become very jealous, especially as, just like her master and Depa, Padme would take on a student about a month after becoming a Jedi Knight. Anakin's jealousy would be apparent, but not enough for Padme to notice. She was very invested in the way of the Jedi, and she paid no mind to Anakin's change in demeanor around her. Truthfully, he was overreacting, because the dynamic between them didn't change at all. However, the change that did happen was on a galactic level. Palpatine could no longer ignore the reality of what was happening in the Outer Rim. He was hoping the Jedi would just ignore it, as they had for centuries, but the young Jedi made his life a living hell. The Republic, due to Jedi intervention, had representatives from the Outer Rim come to Coruscant and discuss what was happening in the Outer Rim. It was atrocious out there, and no one was doing anything for them. They needed help, and the Republic was contentious letting them suffer. The Slave Rebellion on Tatooine spread out, and the entire Outer Rim was under war. Palpatine believed he could use this in favor of his own political motivations. He couldn't storm the Outer Rim for a number of reasons, but mostly due to his need to make sure a Separatist movement could form against him and the future Separatists had a chance to build up their armies. Palpatine needed time, but the Republic moved forward. Days of debate continued and it only got worse. The Jedi were ferrying themselves to the Outer Rim to provide more insight into what was happening. This was mostly in thanks to Mace Windu, which in reality trickled down to Padme, who initially made the move into the Outer Rim. Her desire to make her friend Anakin feel heard led to a nearly cataclysmic change within the Republic itself. While the representatives from the Outer Rim didn't have power, they did have a voice, and because of said voice, they were able to convince Republic senators to turn on Palpatine. Sheev created a filibuster to make sure that no one could proceed past these hearings. Politically, it seemed sound, and it was technically the right choice for him to make because anything other than that would have ruptured his plans for galactic domination. However, due to a public outcry and the public rallying around the clips that had been leaked from the Senate hearings to the wider Republic, it became an extreme issue for many people. People in the public were calling for Palpatine's resignation. On the other side of the aisle, people supported the filibuster. What inevitably happened was a simple irony of how Palpatine came to the office. A vote of no confidence would be levied against him, and he, along with his closest allies in office, would be ousted from power. Palpatine's power was no more, and who rose to power was Anaconda Far, a very popular politician whose voice was met with considerable support. Being from Rhodia, which was as close to the Outer Rim as any system could be, Rhodia being located between the Mid Rim and Outer Rim, made Anaconda Far the perfect candidate to be the next Chancellor, especially in such a crucial juncture for Outer Rim history. The crime lords were weak and the Nile were all but gone. It was now or never. While all this was happening inside the Senate, Anakin realized that his jealousy and insecurity were misplaced. He was in the wrong, and truthfully, he wished he had realized this earlier. He needed to be appreciative for his friend. She was a Jedi. Things would never work out that way. Maybe he could dream of having that type of life, but it seemed impossible, especially as a Jedi. Instead of being envious, he should be happy and overjoyed. Padme was becoming a Jedi Master, working dedicatedly with her new student. This was something Padme, on numerous occasions, told Anakin she wanted. She spent her entire life working towards this moment, always wanting a student, and at the first chance she got to have one, she took it. He shouldn't be envious of this, though it did leave Padme a bit dismayed. She was obviously enthralled to have a student. She would continue the legacy of Mace's lineage with pride. However, part of her wanted to be a part of whatever was to become at the Outer Rim. The Jedi would be going, and while they wouldn't travel as an army or as generals, they'd be assisting in relief efforts. The issue Padme was having was the fact that Padawans, and anything lower than that, were not allowed to be that far out in the galaxy, and because there were hundreds of Jedi already going, she'd have no place in being out there. Mace did notice his former student's shame about this, but reminded her to be prideful. She was responsible for helping free the Outer Rim and their people. The move into the Outer Rim would be a difficult one, especially for someone like Yoda, but being that it was helmed by Master of the Order Mace Windu, it wouldn't be stopped. Yoda's complacency destroyed what was a prideful order, now Mace was its saving grace, before it could be destroyed. The Jedi would have involvement for the following years. Some of it would involve violence, but for the most part it would be relief. Thanks to a new Jedi outpost set up in the Outer Rim, the Jedi were more present than ever before. Padme would read reports on the situation unfolding in the Outer Rim the entire time it happened. Being that she was no longer a student, Mace would tell her what he could, not council information, but you know, stuff that he could reveal. 
He didn't inform her of everything, obviously. That was safe for council members, and Pat knew was alright with that. No need to fuss with him. He never played favorites, is what made Mace a great Jedi. Padme taught her student everything she knew, and he reciprocated it exceptionally well. Similar to how Mace chose Padme, she chose Becker Dienen, who was a very well-read and very intelligent Jedi. The two of them were literal parallels to each other, and it helped them meld together really well. It's why Anakin was so jealous initially. However, he came around to appreciating her for her, as he began to see her as an inspiration. He decided to focus on his work more, not just for time and attention from her, but because he wanted to better himself as a Jedi. The whole emotions thing was difficult, but it was alright. He learned how to become emotionally stable, which was a huge step forward from what he was. With Palpatine out of office, he spent the duration of the previous few years trying to restructure his plan. He was trying to hide the fact that he was a Sith, and Dooku could not be involved with a Sith either. Palpatine went to the crime lords to try to rally them together, however they were far too afraid of the power behind the Republic. Originally, the territory was left in their control after the Nile fell. But the crime lords, even unified, wouldn't stand a chance against the Republic military. It was proven by the skirmishes and clashes thus far into the conflict. They were going to lose, so now it was all about securing what power they could. Palpatine was dissatisfied, but he found a way around it. As the Republic set up governments in the Outer Rim, and means for them to have representation within the Republic, Palpatine swept in. He knew that with a weak system, he could place in the power individuals who could disrupt the entire process. If he could find the right individuals to put into power, then perhaps he could make the new Chancellor look foolish, and if said Chancellor looked foolish, then he could be overthrown. It could also make the Republic look inept in the light of trying to fix a problem they created. He immediately got to work on his new plan. Inside the temple, due to the intensity of the era they were living in, Padme and Bacor had a lot of very critical missions due to the effort in the Outer Rim. While initially they were barred from taking younglings or Padawans that far into hostile territory, the Jedi Outpost provided a layer of security, and the third year after the conflict began, Padawans were allowed to accompany their masters into the Outer Rim. This is where Padme surprisingly excelled as an instructor. She was able to help Bacor through his studies in intense situations, and due to how well he thrived on the front lines, she believed, similarly to her master, that at the age of 17, Bacor would make a fine Jedi Knight. The ceremony wouldn't be on Coruscant, but he would have the distinct honor of being the first Jedi in the Order to have a knighting ceremony inside this outpost, and the first Jedi in a hundred years to be knighted outside of the Coruscant Temple. It was an honor he took with great stride and joy. His success was due to his instructor, but much like her own success as a student, it was due to his hard work. At the age of 23, Padme would accompany Master Windu on a number of missions across the Outer Rim, to assist with governments being set up to support the Republic out here. There were still some crime lords, and the stench of corruption would last for decades, but it was all in the right direction. Padme was very enthralled to be with her master again. Being an instructor was very difficult for her, and she legitimately had her struggles with being a Jedi Master, but as it was with Padme, she found a way to overcome such difficulties. Though, just after Padme turned 23, she and Mace were sent out to Hypori, because Jedi Master Coleman Trebor had been killed by a lightsaber. No one knew who did it, or how it happened, but it turned all the positivity in the Outer Rim into a dissonant vibe. Not many within the Order would be informed of his death, or how it came to be. What was told was kept within the chambers of the Jedi Council, or of course, Padme kept what she saw a secret and didn't tell anyone. With Mace escorting Coleman's body back to Coruscant, Master Nibiri would join up with Master Kenobi and Anakin as they began their first round of missions out here. Despite the bond between Padme and Anakin, she was fairly close with Obi-Wan. This was due to the fact that they were both so similar to each other, both being overachievers and dedicated to their craft. Kenobi and Nibiru would begin with a mission to Kindo, to deal with the rise of an authoritarian leader, someone who rose to power by ripping up the Republic's democratic process. When the Jedi arrived, something seemed so off about the entire situation. Again, like she did when she was a Padawan, Master Nibiru did a deep dive into Kindo. While there wasn't a political system as in-depth as one the Republic set up, the politician who became an authoritarian wasn't someone from the original political system. He was actually an individual who had extremist views about the Republic and was funded into power, but that's where the trail stopped. As a Jedi, she couldn't just believe in coincidences, but that's what it looked like. Obi-Wan was a master negotiator, so he was able to work out a deal in which the government, the authoritarian, and the Republic could all benefit. The irony is, the people of Kindo assassinated the authoritarian about a week after the deal was made. Though what started to catch Padme's attention was the fact that there seemed to be something else going on here. The very next mission was another political one. Anakin loathed these missions, but with his friend with him, it was easier to digest. Master Nibiri was really beginning to think something was wrong here. While they weren't on the current world, 
another couple missions were released inside the data center of the Jedi Outpost, which Padme's tablet had a connection to. Across the Outer Rim, there were similar cases of individuals propping up like they did on Kindo. It wasn't like it was normal either. Some of them had a crazy amount of credits for no reason, especially after previously being bums in the street. On top of that, there were assassinations and bombings consistently. Some might say it was Republic conspiracy, but the truth is, there was a darkness lurking. It could be felt through the Force. There was no way it could be the Sith. Master Nibiri broke off from Obi-Wan and Anakin to return to the outpost on Socorro, and begin requesting transcripts from everyone on the politically involved mission. She then got in contact with her master, who was already en route to the outpost. Padme informed him that there was a connection to the rise in political disturbances. He told her that when he arrived, they'd pick up on the investigation together. What aided their push for this is that after Mace returned to Coruscant, Master Trevor spelt had a data chip in it. He kept everything hidden to make sure that if he was discovered, then the Jedi would have all the information they needed. Essentially, he collected everything that Padme had. The only difference is he had information regarding on who was funding these investments. All of it went back to Damask Holdings, which was odd because the business had apparently gone out of existence after Hegu Damask II disappeared, but that wasn't the case. With a bit of investigation, Padme before Mace arrived was able to connect the account back to Dooku. However, what was noticed before that is that the account paid for Sheev Palpatine's campaigns on Naboo, and even for his raise in the Senate. She didn't want to seem too far ahead of herself, but she believed it was entirely possible for Palpatine to be a Sith Lord, or at least connected to them in some way, shape, or form. She asked her former instructor how they might find the Sith, and with confidence, he told her they needed to be where the Sith hadn't been yet. So, for the coming months, the two of them along with Obi-Wan and Anakin would spend time searching for the Sith. There were other duos in the Order doing so, but they were very discreet about their mission. No need for the information to be leaked. After having spent months searching, Padme believed she found the scent, and so the two duos were sent to Bakura. Mace and Padme went to the capital, and Kenobi and Skywalker went to the other most populated city on the planet, both of which not more than a couple dozen miles away from each other. Master Nibiri led herself and Master Windu into the alleyways of the city, and followed shadows on the walls. The person they were tracking had a bit of a spotlight. He ran an extremist broadcast, that had a very small audience. Sidious and Dooku were interested in his abilities, because he had the ability to go the distance. The Sith were inside the man's studio, and basically interrogating him. Despite the Jedi reacting to what the Sith had done, their corruption was seeping into the fragile system, and it was taking too long to repair the damage that was done. The Sith were winning. Padme and Mace crept through a hallway outside the studio, and Padme tapped the transponder on her wrist to alert the other Jedi. Chances are, they wouldn't get here in time. The two Jedi listened in and watched the three men conversing. They recorded everything they could, and Mace laid out a strategy for a student and him to follow. After about 30 minutes, the Sith would realize they were being watched, as they killed the broadcaster so he wouldn't reveal anything before Dooku and Sidious turned around with their blades ignited. Padme and Mace were quick to retaliate as they moved in. Padme was very well trained, and she was formidable with a lightsaber, but she was out of her league here. With Dooku and Sidious both using the dark side, Mace could defeat them both just not at the same time. If it was a one versus one, it wouldn't be an issue. Maybe Dooku would though. But for Mace, he trusted his student. He knew that if they worked in tandem, he wouldn't have to worry about her, which was the entire point of doing this. The duos of Master and Apprentices engaged. First, Windu blocked Sidious and Padme went up against Dooku. It was so tragic for her. She never wanted it to come to this. She used to adore him when she was a Padawan. They crossed blades again. Mace and Padme switched up. Dooku versus Mace and Padme versus Sidious. This was the strategy. With Padme having been trained in Vapod, she was able to hold her own against both Sith. The biggest issue for her was making progress against them. Their duel rocked the city, light versus dark. If they failed here, then it would be the end for either side of this conflict. Mace switched with Padme again, and their duel continued. Mace had a much easier approach against Sidious. Dooku and Windu knew each other's moves, Sidious didn't. He was at a disadvantage. The reason Padme could stay involved so long with Dooku was due to her time watching Mace and Dooku spar as a Padawan. When the moment was rice, Mace threw Sidious back and before he could land a killing blow, he heard Padme cry out in pain. Mace saw her drop to the ground grabbing her dominant hand, but it was just the end of her wrist, the hand was cut off. Windu yelled out and felt Sidious's blade be driven through his stomach. Everything moved in slow motion for Windu. He used all of his strength and crushed the support beams over Dooku, which was essentially over Padme. But he knew she would have this. The support of the building caved in, and Mace turned around and used the force to extinguish his lightsaber as he fell to his knees before him. Palpatine tried to back up, but Mace looked into his eyes and told him that this was the end of his order. 
Sidious' lightsaber imploded and killed both Sidious and Windu. Due to what Mace did, he was able to eradicate Sidious entirely. He was left on the ground with a wound that would kill him before the building caved in. Padme and Dooku were stuck under the building as it fell down on top of them. Dooku was holding up with all their strength, so was Padme, and he told her to join him. Together they could, before he could finish the line she cut him off. She told him that she used to look up to him but now she was so disappointed. Her lightsaber ignited and because Dooku was holding up the support, he panicked. The lightsaber removed his head before the building collapsed down on top of her. Padme would be removed alongside Dooku, Sidious, and Mace Windu in the coming hours. She would wake up on Coruscant inside a medical facility, next to her friend Anakin Skywalker and her former student Bicor Dianum. Both were so worried for her. Obi-Wan and the Council were cleaning up the mess, but they explained her what was found and it broke her heart. Though she was grateful the two of them showed up, being that most of her friends were in the outer room cleaning up the mess left behind by the Sith. The following weeks would be challenging. Padme Naberi would have to come to terms with the death of her master and the loss of her hand. She would also have the ability to become a master on the High Council, being that she, like her instructor, were so influential in the modern order. Master Naberi would accept said offer and become a member on the High Council, just like her teacher. It would be a way to remember the legacy he left behind as the greatest Jedi to ever live, in her opinion. While the Outer Rim would be left in shambles, over what the Sith did, the release of the Jedi recordings of Palpatine and Dooku helped the public see what was really happening. The Jedi reinstated a public distrust in the Sith, and while the religion was dead, they wanted to ensure that the Sith could never return in a future generation. Because while there was balance, darkness always had a chance to rise. Chancellor Anaconda Far would be the symbol of a gilded age in Republic history. His work during the rise of the Outer Rim expansion would be studied for years to follow. After becoming a council member, Padme would begin to follow in her master's footsteps and begin pushing for more Jedi outposts across the galaxy, and even suggesting that the Jedi lower the minimum midichlorian count requirement. It also would be accepted. Padme, just like her master, would be the youngest master brought onto the council, only a total of seven months younger than he was when he joined their ranks. On the other hand, Padme's relationship with Skywalker had always been friendly, but as he moved on from being a Padawan, their relationship was explored in other ways. These ways included Padme forgoing some of her attachment to the Code. To call it a relationship was generous. Both of them understood that their mandate was to the Order, and so they would follow the Order instead of their own emotions. Their bond would be on and off, and it would never produce any children, which was entirely intentional. The galaxy would be reshaped by Anaconda Far, but a year after the revelation by the Jedi of the Sith, the Kemenon army would be revealed. The Republic would be iffy about the entire thing, but with a couple sparse droid rebellions from corporate machines, the clones would be utilized. The creation of the clone army would be revealed that it was done by the Sith, and the Republic would understand that the Jedi were not responsible. Padme's tenure as a Jedi would include three more students, and taking up a mantle her master once held. She may have been born nearly 60 years after the High Republic, but she would be one of the most important faces in the rise of this new era of a Gilded Republic. And that, my friends, is our story. And special thanks to Galvan Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Cullen Rooney, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Master Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Gunning City 66, Family Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortress Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, the Mary Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Edwin for supporting the channel. If you want to support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon. All the things are down below. Otherwise, let's talk about the story. So with Padme, I think you need to have like a kind of investigative story. I thought it'd be interesting to pair her up with Windu. Uh, and I also had like uh, I also had the idea that I didn't want a relationship to form between her and Anakin. I, I just didn't think that'd naturally occur. I think there's something that could happen, but it'd be like a situation ship. It wouldn't be like a full-fledged marriage type thing. The focus of the story is how Padme deals with being a Jedi, and how her studious nature but also her friendship with Anakin would have a butterfly effect on the galaxy. Padme in canon is very, very much so a humanitarian, and so I think that would just play into her being a Jedi even more so. Being that the Jedi would have a more hands-on involvement with humanitarian work, I think she'd be more involved. I think she could have a Dooku-like vibe where she's like, I don't agree with the Order, but I don't think she'd ever fall from it, but in the story I don't think she'd ever go that far just simply due to being Mace's student. So I hope y'all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.